our study of the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm going to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one for you to follow along. So we have Bibles at Welcome. And James 1.19 tells us that every person should be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So you teach your kids if you say you have two ears and one mouth so that you listen twice as much as you talk. In 1 Peter 3.10, the word God tells us whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. God's word guides us and tells us to be silent when we are tempted to lie. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19, tells us that where words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent or wise. Proverbs 17, 28 says, even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. God's Word gives us guidance on when we are to speak, and God's Word gives us guidance on when we are to be silent. And yet it might be shocking, confusing, or to some degree even unexpected to hear from Jesus this morning as He continues the Sermon on the Mount where He tells us that there is a scenario that we ought not to speak in. And that scenario is preaching to lost individuals. There is a situation where we are called to be silent when it comes to the truth of God's Word and the Gospel and preaching to non-believers. Listen to the Word of God from Matthew 7. Matthew 7, we'll begin in verse 1 for context, and we'll focus only on verse 6, where we study verses 1 to 5 last Sunday. Jesus, continuing his Sermon on the Mount, preaches this, Judge not, that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? Are you hypocrite? First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy. And do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Verse 6 is not something that you're going to find on a mug. <laughs> Verse 6 is something that does not, at first, make sense to us. And it seems random and out of place. It seems that Jesus is preaching a sermon as if he's writing the book of Proverbs, giving us random truths that may not have any kind of connection. And though it seems that way, that is not the case, dear church. There is this connection in the first five verses to what Jesus is saying in verse 6. In the first five verses, as we studied last Sunday, Jesus has warned his disciples and us who are following the Lord in our kingdom citizens that we are not to have a critical spirit when it comes to judging other brothers and sisters. We were called to not be hypocritical. We were called to remove the log out of our own eye in order to then minister to those who have a speck in theirs. There was guidance for us as kingdom citizens to live in relationship with other believers. And now there is guidance for us when it comes to a specific type of non-believer. As 
here in the world, there is a scenario that as we engage with non-believers, we are to handle the gospel with discernment, which means at times being slow to speaking. Three lessons that I believe Jesus wants to teach us in this single verse. Three lessons that will minister to us in not only understanding what Matthew 7, 6 tells us, but also in how we are to engage the non-believing world. The first lesson is that Jesus tells us to be aware of dogs and pigs. Jesus tells us to be aware of dogs and pigs. We have to stop, uh, spot the difference. We have to have discernment. And Jesus has been using beautiful imagery throughout the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, pictures that have been vivid, wonderful, beautiful. You are the salt and the light. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. You can instantly envision it. And you see that city glowing at night as it sits there on the hill. He's told us to not worry. And then he told us to look at the lilies of the field, how they are arrayed in greater beauty and splendor than Solomon. He tells us to not worry about what we shall eat and drink. He says, look at all the birds whom are fed and taken care of. There's being these beautiful pictures, vivid images for us to see at Jesus, as Jesus teaches. And now he gives us an extremely negative one, dogs and pigs. And if you were there, sitting at his feet listening, a vision would enter into your mind. What Jesus does here is, it, 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 it's somewhat poetic. You have to see how this is structured. The, the first statement corresponds with the final statement, and then the second statement corresponds with the third statement. Look at this. Do not give dogs what is holy, and then the response to that, or the, the result of that is, they will turn to attack you. And then he says, do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot. So he creates this scenario, this picture for his disciples and us to see that if you feed dogs, they will attack you. And if you give pearls to swine, to pigs, they will trample them underfoot. He's gone from humor to disgust. In the previous text, he's given this illustration in this picture of an individual with a massive beam coming out of their eye, and it was somewhat entertaining and funny, and now he is giving us an image that would be gross and disgusting for the original listeners. Dogs and pigs. And you have opinions about dogs. Some of you love dogs. An unhealthy amount of love towards dogs. I guarantee you, if aliens existed and they landed on this earth and they saw how human beings treat dogs, how they walk after them with a little leash and they pick up after them and they feed them, they would think the dog is the master and the person is its servant. Some of you love dogs. You buy clothes for them and you put them in purses and, and random things like that. Some of you are potentially scared of dogs. You were attacked to, by a dog. You watched the sandlot and those memories are still with you. You need to ignore whatever picture you might have about dogs and think about the picture that would have entered into their mind these street animals that were vultures and scavengers. Unclean, dangerous, disgusting. They weren't pets. They weren't domesticated. Jesus gives us a parable in Luke 16. You don't have to turn there, but there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who feasted every day. And at his gate was a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. More even, the dogs came and licked his sores. These street dogs that would lick the sores of those who were homeless and destitute on the street. Exodus chapter 22 reminds Israel that there is certain food that is consecrated to the Lord. Therefore, you have to make sure to not give that holy food to 
two unholy dogs. Exodus 22, 31, you shall be consecrated to me. Therefore, you shall not eat any flesh that is torn by beasts in the field. You shall throw it to the dogs. There's certain food that should be fed to dogs. It is unclean food, defiled food, not that which is holy and set apart. Our gracious Lord does not speak well of man's best friend here. It is not a domesticated animal. It is a scavenger. And at times, even the Jewish individuals would use dog as a derogatory term towards Gentiles. Those who are unclean. Those who are not holy. Those who don't know God's law and are not obedient to God's revelation. And even the scriptures itself in Revelation 22, 15 tells us that dog is used as a term for unbelievers. Those who do not appreciate God's laws, those who cannot appreciate what is valuable to God, and those who desecrate with that which, that which is set apart as holy. So what were these dogs doing? What is the scenario that Jesus is painting? He says, do not give dogs what is holy. And you have to understand the Levitical system. You have to understand that there were things that were designated as holy by the Israelites. Things that were set apart for specific use. The altar on which sacrifices took place was holy. The utensils that were used for the altar were holy. The food that would be given and sacrificed on the altar would be consecrated and called holy. Holy, and that is the reason why even the food that would be left over could only be eaten by the Levites. It was set apart, it was unique, and if it wasn't completely burned on the altar with fire, nothing would be allowed to last past the third day because it was holy, and therefore. Only the Levites can eat it. Jesus is painting a scenario that you are taking the food that has been designated as holy and you are feeding it to a dog, which is an unclean animal. That is the picture that is entering into their minds to treat something that is holy as profane. Even the Qumran community, they have notes about this. That one author, in talking about that community of Israelites, said that all dogs should be banned from the holy city so that they don't accidentally eat sacred meat. This is a picture that they knew. This is a metaphor that they understood. This is giving something special to someone who will not see the value of it and who will make it unclean. And then he says pigs. Pigs. And your mind might go to Charlotte's Web, Cuba Wilbur. Your mind might go to that petting zoo, that pumpkin patch. If dogs were disgusting, well, pigs were pigs. They were the epitome of being unclean, literally and spiritually. Pigs are dirty because they live outdoors in the mud. They were filthy animals. And then the Word of God, the Levitical system, told the Israelites and Leviticus 10, uh, 11, 7, that the pig should not be eaten because it parts the hoof and is cloven-footed, but does not chew the cud. Therefore, it is unclean to you. God made this animal as unclean. They were not allowed to participate in enjoying this type of food. What? Jesus, when he gives the, prayer, the parable of the prodigal son, the most disgusting scenario he can paint of someone being unclean is this young individual working with pigs. That's what Jesus chooses to talk about, hitting rock bottom. They are dirty, they are defiled, and they are of not much value in comparison to what Jesus says is being given to them, which is pearls. We don't value pearls. The value of pearls was even greater in that time. There were only a few places in the world where they could be obtained, and a trade was not as broad as we have it now. 
Therefore, taking something that is of extreme value, so much so that Jesus even uses a, a parable about the precious pearl, when he, when he talks about the merchant that sells everything that he has in order to get this one pearl, because that's how valuable this pearl is, we see this contrast. Something that is set apart and holy, given to an unholy animal. Something that is valuable and precious and wonderful and beautiful and given as food to a defiled animal that will never properly appreciate it. Pigs don't discriminate when it comes to food. They will eat anything. But here we see that even these pearls that are valuable that are given to these pigs are ones that they reject and they trample underfoot. Something that is valuable to you is not valuable to them and they trample on it. What we see here is Jesus creating imagery to talk about someone who does not have the spiritual ability to recognize the value of something given to them. They cannot discriminate between what is good and what is bad. And Jesus says, don't give them holy food. Don't give them precious pearls. Two commands. He's saying protect that which is holy. Protect that which is precious. And protect yourself. Because what will they do? They will trample them underfoot. And then talking about the dog, they will attack you. These pigs, they get these pearls. They realize that they're not food. They spit it out. And in disgust and frustration, they begin to trample on them. And the dog, once you feed it, it doesn't know that you fed it sacred meat. But what does a scavenger want? A scavenger wants more. So it comes after you and attacks you in order to acquire more. Jesus is not intending these words to be interpreted literally. Jesus is trying to teach his disciples a lesson of when not to speak. And it begins with understanding who dogs and pigs are. This isn't anti-Gentile. Let, let's clarify this. Some might say, well, well, Jesus is using dog in a derogatory way to, to mock Gentiles and to say Gentiles should never hear the gospel. No, that, that's ludicrous to think that way. Because in, in the genealogy of Matthew chapter 1, we see multiple instances of Gentiles, pagans, non-Jews being included even in Jesus' lineage. And then you open up to Matthew chapter 2, and you see that it is the Magi, the wise men that come, who are Gentiles, and not Israelites who worship the King Jesus. And then the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, that the gospel needs to go to the ends of the world. Jesus is not telling his Jewish followers to stop preaching the gospel message to anybody who is not a Jew. That is not the message here. When he says dogs and pigs, it is unbelievers, but a unique type of unbeliever. A special type of unbeliever. Look, Jesus tells his disciples to love their enemies. Jesus tells his disciples to care for those who are sinners. Even, even Jesus interacts with tax collectors and prostitutes. This is not saying stop preaching to anybody who's a non-believer. This is a type of non-believer. Spurgeon says it this way. He says the saints are not to be judges. Talking about verses 1 to 5. But equally they are not to be simpletons. We are called to use discernment and discretion to know when to speak the gospel to specific non-believers and when to be silent. And it's not because of, oh, they're dogs and pigs. It's because I'm holding something so precious that I don't want to give it to dogs and pigs who will trample on it. Which gets us to our second lesson. And the second lesson is... Jesus tells us not only to be aware of dogs and pigs, Jesus tells us when to speak and when to be silent. When to feed and when not to feed. When to give holy and pearls and when to refrain from giving that which is holy and that which is precious. In order for you to know when not to give something to someone entails that you are regularly giving something to everyone. 
This is where we have to begin, this logic. The command to not do something assumes that you are regularly doing this. For him to say, don't give holy and pearls to this type of individual assumes that you are regularly giving out that which is holy and pearls to everyone. And you might say, what is this that he's talking about? That which is holy and, and these pearls. What is he getting at? What, what does this actually mean? Well, you've got to understand the word holy. The word holy in the Greek literally means that which is without ground. That which is not of this earth. That which is set apart and not dirty. That which is unique, spiritual, from the heavens, and to some degree supernatural. And here Jesus adds an article, that which is the holy, he says, even though the translation doesn't give it to you. There's an article. There is this unique, holy thing. And when he compares it with pearls, we can assume that it is the gospel message. The truth of his word. The beauty of the salvation that is to be found in Christ. Jesus uses in just a few chapters, Matthew 13, a pearl as a picture of someone finding the kingdom of God. He equates the kingdom of God to pearls. Friends, for us to understand when we are to be silent, we have to understand the message that we have that is precious and wonderful. Maybe you don't get what he's saying because you don't hold the value with any kind of, uh, you don't hold the gospel with any kind of value or that which is precious. I, I mean, when we begin to think about what the gospel is, we begin to realize that the Bible tells us that we were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but by the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The Holy Scriptures, 2 Timothy 3.15, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. It is not just pearls, it is your pearls. The truth that you believe, the gospel message that you hold to, something that is valuable to you, the beautiful reality that God Almighty, when all of humanity rebelled against him, the second person of our triune God, condescended, took on human flesh, lived a perfect life, died on a Roman cross, was raised on the third day, so that whoever places their faith in him finds salvation, forgiveness, a unique relationship with their triune God, and everlasting glory. That is supposed to be holy and precious and valuable to us. That's where it begins. That is where it begins. It has to be of great value to you. Because if you start looking at, oh, they're just pigs and dogs, and that's your motivation to not share the gospel in those unique, minimal, often rare situations, then you got it all wrong. It's seen how beautiful the gospel is. And because you see how beautiful the gospel is, you are to be to some degree like Oprah. And you get pearls. And you get pearls. And you get pearls. I want everyone to get pearls. So you share. You share. And you share. Because it's beautiful. And it's valuable. Because a lot of Christians want to use verse 6 to make themselves feel better because they're apathetic to never share the gospel message. Oh, they're all dogs. They're all pigs. I don't want to share. They're, they're not worthy of it. Oh, no, friend, that is not. That is not the idea here. The idea here is because something is so valuable to you, you regularly share it, and in very rare situations, do you withhold it? Maybe you always withhold it. Maybe you never want anyone to have that which is holy and the pearls that are yours. That's where it begins to see how valuable this is. Do you know how valuable the truth of the gospel is? One preacher speaks of his experience in Nepal. A cat named 
He talks about this river, this Hindu holy spot where they would do these funeral fires. And the custom was to take a family member who dies and to put them on a boat and then set them on fire and release them into the river to let the ashes come down on the river. And this will help with the process of reincarnation. And he says, as you sit there, you see these burning bodies on this river. It is such a graphic image of their eternal damnation in the lake of fire because they rejected the most precious truth, which is that you can be saved as you cling to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Do you see how precious it is? It's not, I won't share the truth because I think you're going to respond bad. I don't want to share the truth because I, 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 uh, you know, I don't think you're worthy of it. No, you say because of how precious this is, you are to assumingly, regularly share it, great commission, but there are very few instances where you are called to be silent. But yet you are called to be silent. Think about it. The irony here is something that is so precious given to something that is not of much value. We have precious things that we don't want people to use. You have stuff in your house that when, when someone comes over, they can touch a bunch of stuff, but don't touch that. that that's actually off limits. I have a Bible. I have a Bible on my bookshelf that's in a box still. Right? It's a very, very special Bible to me. And I have it on my shelf. I and maybe a few other people have opened it, and that is supposed to stay in the box, on the shelf. I know it sounds weird. Just trust me. I do it, and then there's one day where I come home from work, and my wife had decided that she needed a new Bible. So she went to my bookshelf, and she pulled the box out, said brand new, still in the box. And she began using it, and as soon as I saw it open on the coffee table, I said, what are you doing reading that Bible? <laughs> so precious to me, don't touch it, put it back in the box, I'll buy you another one. I explained to her why. Daddy will hear this. Something that's so valuable that you say, you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to give it to you. I'm not going to give it to you. This is not talking about people who are sinners. No, nope. Jesus hung out with tax collectors and prostitutes. The worst of the worst. Jesus hung out. Jesus evangelized. Jesus accepted them as his disciples. This is not us looking at someone and saying, I think you're unworthy because you need to get better as a sinner. I think you're unworthy because you've done this in the past. This is not what's being getting at. There is something very, very unique and rare about this, and it's based on what they do with the truth. So when are we going to be silent? Look at the, the dogs do. They consume that which is holy, and then they turn to attack you, back half of it, and pay you and attacks you. Look, there's two types of people in the world. Those that believe in Jesus Christ, and then those who reject Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Those are the only two types of people that exist in the world, but in that second category, Jesus is telling us about an individual of folks who are opposed to the gospel violently with the intent to mock, ridicule, and shame out of disrespect. And Jesus says, see how valuable this gospel message is. Don't let it be just mocked for any reason. It's that friend that says, yeah, tell me what you believe again. You say, hey, you know, you know you don't want to hear it. You know, you just want me to tell you this so that you can begin to refute it, so that you can begin to mock it, so that you can begin to laugh at it and see, you know, say how foolish I am for believing in this thing. Why, why do you want to hear it again? Your intent isn't to listen. You're not even open to asking questions. You, you just want to hear it so that you can mock it. And Jesus is saying here that the gospel of the kingdom is too glorious to be dragged through the mud. And this is hard, friends. This is hard to have enough discernment on when to do this. Because I was an individual that grew up in the church 
that reviled, mocked, and ridiculed the gospel. And so are some of you. You knew it, you made fun of it, you ridiculed it, you saw how silly and pathetic it was. And, and what if someone did discriminate and they stopped talking to you? So, so this is a, a challenging situation to fully understand. It, it, it's such a unique thing and it should be so rare that some commentators have said that's why Jesus gives five verses for one topic and one verse for this topic because he's showing you that this is going to be so rare. You should not come to this judgment and the only way that you'll find out if someone ever is a dog and pig that wants to make fun of the gospel is by planning multiple times regularly sharing it with them. What kind of people usually fall into this category? You'll be surprised. It's usually... It's usually not sinners. It's usually not sinners who know that they're sinners and they just reject Christianity and the gospel. Usually, it's hypocrites and religious people. Listen to Philippians 3 2. Look out for the dogs, Paul says. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. He said, you know those false teachers that keep trying to get you to go back to the law to earn your righteousness through circumcision and through the law? You need to watch out for those dogs. They are mocking the gospel. Second Peter 2.22 talks about those who are false teachers. Typically... The person who falls into this category is the one who's been super close to the church. They believed to some degree. They were at the doorstep for a while. And then they took a class. They learned something else. They figured that this isn't the right fit. It doesn't work with my lifestyle. So what do they usually try to do with their old friends that are Christians? They say, yeah, yeah, tell me about that. And then they begin to mock it. And then they begin to shame it. And then they begin to revile against it. And it's usually people who are churched, who are now unchurched, that often fall into this category. It's, it's the hypocrites. It's the legalists. It is the false teachers. In March 2015, there's an article written called, Presbyterian Minister Doesn't Believe in God But Defends His Christianity. This Presbyterian minister says God is a human product as opposed to special revelation from a divine being. He said God doesn't exist. He's an atheist. Yet he still wanted to be a proud minister. He's a, I'm, he's a Presbyterian minister who doesn't believe in God. And he says this. He says, beliefless Christianity is thriving right now. Beliefless Christianity is thriving right now even as other forms of the faith are falling away rapidly. Many liberal and progressive Christians have already let go or de-emphasized belief in heaven, that the Bible is literally true, that Jesus is supernatural, and that Christianity is the only way, yet they still practice what they call Christianity. That's a dog in You don't shame the gospel that way. Dogs and pigs are the ones that say, anyone can partake in the Lord's table. It's not set apart and holy. Even if you're a non-believer, partake. I don't know if you're a Christian or not. Let me baptize you anyway. Oh, well, health, prosperity, good things for you. Let's make this church as secret as we possibly can because our goal is just to appease and make everyone happy. Those are usually the type of people who are dogs and pigs. You say, stop trampling on our gospel message. To let other people share the truth with them because they have been honest to me. And it's just mockery and shame and ridicule at this point. Friends, this is rare. This takes great discernment. We have to be very slow to judge anyone as a dog or a pig. But when it is clear that they are, Jesus tells us, stop, just, he dies and another one marries her and he dies and the list continues on. And their question is, which one of them will be his wife in the resurrection, trying to mock the resurrection? And if Jesus was going to be foolish, which Jesus is not, he would have said, well, based on that assessment, I think they probably, the first one probably had the closest 
religion. No, that's foolish. He begins talking about the reality of the resurrection. And he said, he is the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. He is the God of the resurrection. I am not playing that silly game of this. Woman at the well. As soon as Jesus starts getting to the heart of it. Well, you Jews, you just worship on that mountain. And you Samaritans, you worship on this mountain. If you're going to answer the people, people a fool, according to this folly, you play that game. Well, you know, well, this is the reason why Samaritans worship here. And this is the reason why Jews know no, there's something bigger than that. Your heart needs the gospel. Why are we playing these games? Why are we talking about these foolish things? Well, when Christians begin to engage with atheists, and, and, and the atheist says, well, let's, let's theoretically imagine that there is no God. And the Christian says, oh, well, sure, let's theoretically imagine that there is no God. Foolish! Okay, okay, okay. No, Romans 1 says you know there is a God and you suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Why are we giving up this word to mess around with atheists when we need to be preaching it as it is not answering the fool according to his or her okay. folly? By becoming foolish you like that. You the house by yourself. Some of you might profane that which is holy because you don't value the gospel. Thank you for being You don't value the things of the Lord. And sadly, some of you young people maybe have become dogs and pigs in this room. Where your parents for years have been preaching the gospel to you. You got to a point where you're just hostile, you reject it, you mock it, you make fun of it. And, and at, at a point in time, you just say, you know what? Maybe I should. Maybe I should just pray for him or her. Let, let someone else do that. Mm -hmm. See where the Lord will take this. Friend, if you are a dog and a pig in this room, if you've been reviling and mocking, I want to tell you that there is hope. Look to the gospel. Look to Jesus Christ on that cross. Believe in him as your Lord and Savior. And all of the guilt and the shame that fuels your mockery. That's why, because you hate yourself. You have this guilt and this shame. That's why you mock it so much. Relinquish that guilt and shame because Christ has paid for it on the cross. If you believe in him, dear friend. Jesus teaches us to know the difference between dogs and pigs and who they are. Jesus teaches us when to speak and when to be silent. And then uh, thirdly, Jesus sets the example for us. I had a few passages to go to, but for the sake of time, I just want to go to one. Jesus taught his disciples. Jesus taught his disciples that if there is a time where people reject the gospel, in Matthew 10, later on, Matthew chapter 10, he literally says in verse 15, truly, truly, I say to you, or verse 14, if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Shake it off. Go on. Move on. Move on to the next house. So Jesus is taught. There's a time where you stop and you move on. Amen. He, he teaches that to his disciples. Paul does this. Acts chapter 13. When, 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 when the Jews make fun of the gospel and they reject the gospel, he says, he says it was necessary. Verse 46 of uh, Acts 13. It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you, but since... You repudiate and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. All right, you guys don't want to listen? We'll go to the Gentiles. And he goes. He goes. He does it in Acts 18 again. He says, the blood will be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now I will go on to the Gentiles. Paul does it in Acts 19.9. He withdrew us from the synagogue in Ephesus because some became stubborn and continued in unbelief. Speaking evil of the way before the congregation. As soon as they start speaking evil and mocking, Paul says, No, oh, mm, all right, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm going to go to the Gentiles. And Jesus even does this. Let's look at it. One quick example of Jesus doing this in Luke chapter 23. Go to Luke chapter 23. Yeah. I remind you that there's 
a time when Jesus stopped speaking to the Pharisees. There's a time where Jesus just let them alone. Jesus doesn't do miracles for non-believers at a specific time. There's times where Jesus stops. Luke 23 is not one of those times. Look at this. Verse 3, Jesus is before Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, You have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. Pilate asks Jesus a question, and then we have other gospel accounts where the discussion is further briefly elaborated on. They have dialogue, and Jesus answers his questions. Even though he's a Gentile, even though he's a non-believer, Jesus engages, and Pilate, even though he is a pagan, is one that is at least honest with his thought process and says, I find no fault in this man. He's still a coward. He still crucifies him and lets the, 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 the leaders do what they do. But Jesus engages with Pilate as Pilate asks questions, even though he's a, a vile sinner. And then there's another situation. Luke 23 Verse 6, when Pilate heard this, whether the man was a Galilean, and when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but Jesus made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by uh, accusing him, and Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt, and they mocked him, they arrayed him in splendid clothing, and he sent him back to Pilate. Pilate asks, Jesus engages. Herod asks, Jesus is silent. And then Herod and his cronies mock him. Herod already knew the information. Mark chapter 6 tells us that John the Baptist had already preached the truth of the kingdom to Herod. That multiple times Herod liked hearing John preach. He liked the message. He started playing around with it. He was entertained by it. He was engaged by it. And he, to some degree, started mocking it. And for him, it was just some entertainment. Jesus, come on, do some of your miracles. Teach me some of your stuff. It wasn't genuine. There was no questions asked. So Jesus said, I will not throw that which is holy to a dog, nor will I let pearls be fed to this pig. He stays silent. Martin Lloyd-Jones says it this way. You answer the questions of Pilate, but you say nothing to a hair. You answer the questions of Pilate, but you say nothing to a hair. Jesus tells us to not let others make a mockery of the gospel, and it is done in respect for that which is holy. Dear friends, May the Lord give you discernment to know when and when not to do this. This should be extremely rare. This should be extremely unique. <laughs> but nonetheless, this very challenging verse that most people want to avoid is one that Jesus Christ himself has given to us to minister to us as kingdom citizens as we engage with non-believers. Two takeaways, can I pray? Number one, church family, don't let that which is precious become cheap in your life. Don't let that which is precious become cheap in your life. See how valuable it is. Treasure it and share it. Share it as much as you possibly can. But as you value it and you share it, the Lord does call you to protect it from those who you want. Father, I humbly acknowledge yes, Lord. that that was probably inadequate of an explanation of a very challenging text to me. I, I know there's so many questions and so many scenarios and so many thoughts that are still in the midst of 
of this congregation. Father, by your spirit, would you minister to your saints in a unique way where you give them the wisdom and the discernment. We ask for wisdom in how to apply this truth. But one easy way that we can apply it, Father, is help us value you. Pearl. Help us value that which is holy, the truth of who Christ is and the salvation that we have in him. May we be faithful to declare it, and may we be faithful to protect it. And if there is anyone in here who has hardened their heart and has become so callous that everyone around them thinks it is impossible for this person to ever get saved, if they become a dog and a pig, I ask you, I plead with you to use the truth of your gospel to penetrate that callous heart right now and give them new life for them to believe in the treasure that is Christ and for them to find their joy in him. And we believe you can do all those things. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Amen.